Hi, welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season here today with Lisa and Venkat. Hey, Venkat, how's it going? Hey, Lisa. Are we talking about, um, are we talking about V for Venkat today? No, I don't want to talk about myself. I think last time we said we would talk about uh, V for Victory. That's right. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, but, uh, you know, just wanted to make sure you had the offer to, to talk about Venkat. Um, <laughs> I talk about myself enough. I have like blogs and newsletters worth of crap that I talk about myself. So do you right. now in your newsletter? That's true. Yeah. yeah, I've been talking about my stuff in my newsletter. My victory is mostly failures, it feels like. Um, <laughs> like, uh, yeah, but I don't know. Oh, so for listeners who aren't sure what we're talking about, I recently started a paid newsletter on Substack called Chain Fail. Um, about, it's about my home mining adventures, mostly misadventures. Um, so is there a chain victory story you could tell? Opposite of a chain fail? Do I have a chain victory story? Mm, most of my chain victories feel so accidental. Um, like, I feel like none of the stuff I've actually like tried to do anything at, like has been successful or victorious. Um, anything that like ended up paying out like some amount of tokens is just like a, what do you call it? Um, accident. Like, you know, I plugged the thing in and checked in a year later. I'm like, oh, I have coins. That's cool. <laughs> um, I don't know. Yeah. yeah, victory seems like uh, that, that's actually a good uh, point. I think victory can have an element of luck, but nothing feels like a victory if there isn't an element of like you planned for it and tried to do it and like uh, consciously attempted to get it. And if then you get it, then it's a victory. Otherwise, it's just a stroke of luck, right? Yeah, I, that's a really good point. Yeah, all of my token stuff feels like, look, actually, it's funny you bring that up because like, so I sent out a post this morning about some Chia mining I've been doing. I haven't been very successful. And then I went and I checked my Chia this afternoon and I had like one, two more blocks in the last 24 hours since I sent the thing out. And it, it like doesn't feel like a victory, um, but I wasn't, I wasn't planning on it. It just like magically showed up my wallet. So yeah. Um, yeah, and I think especially in crypto, it's like so much designed around randomized algorithms and luck and stuff like that. Like random and r pure true randomness is built into the system itself. Uh, what's at the other extreme of something where it's like arguably nothing to do with luck, like leaving out like the luck of genetics and having good genes or talent for something. Let's treat that as outside of scope. But what's the purest non-luck kind of victory you could have? I almost feel like it's the like just showing up. What's that quote that like ninety percent of success is just showing up or ninety five percent? Yeah, yeah. I think that was Woody up. Allen. Yeah. Yeah, Woody Allen's quote. I think so. There's a lot of times I think I end up being successful just because I show up places, um, and I think that's kind of the opposite of luck. It's like literally like you just you show up. You like literally just show up and like things happen. And it's like why did all this stuff happen? It's like oh well, I just kept showing up. Um, yeah. yeah. And the relation there to randomness is I think there's certain domains where like there's going to be both negative and positive events. So you have to have resilience to overcome the negative events. And then you just had to wait long enough for the positive events to come in. But then when they do, it doesn't feel like luck. Like if you show up every day and the system is something where every hundred day you get a stroke of luck and you get three strokes of luck over 300 days, that's not really luck, that's math, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> right. I guess, of... you know, like showing up is a lot like staying crypto mining, right? Like keeping your machines on means you're showing up every day at the like coin lottery. Yeah. Um, or to take a more familiar example, like victory in the stock market is about like staying in, like uh, dollar cost average on the way in, stay in and hold long for like decades. And on the other end, to the extent you're lucky, you're lucky in the way the entire American stock market has been lucky for centuries. If you're unlucky, then you share in uh, bad luck of everybody. But okay, so speaking of that, like uh, I would say like uh, most of my stock investing is in like index funds and stuff. So I'm in like the just show up uh, category of investing to the tune of 90%. But then I have made like individual stock picks that I would say were like planned and thought out and turned out to win. Like right after the pandemic started, I was like, 
I need to buy more Amazon and I need to buy Zoom. And these were not like uh, counterintuitive weird picks, right? Like anybody who thought 30 seconds about it would say video conferencing and home delivery, so Zoom and Amazon. And I bought them and it was like a basic prediction worked out and um, Amazon <laughs> went up 3X and Zoom went up 4X. So it's like, uh, yeah. My only regret would be not buying more, perhaps. But I, I bet as much as I was like willing to risk losing entirely that kind of thing, like you know, usual single stock picking uh, risk management. But that's uh, I would call that a genuine victory. Like I thought about it, I placed a yeah. bet in sort of a place I could potentially lose, and I won. So that's a real victory with luck involved. Yeah. Yeah, but it sounds like um, it sounds like it feels like a victory, right? Yeah, it does, especially because there's nothing in that particular case that marks me as unique. Like basically anybody with a stock trading account could have done what I did. Like unlike say getting into crypto early, you'd have to have been in the right circles to hear about it. Getting in on like, you know, Genesis sales for like important coins. You kind of have to be in the right place at the right time. But buying a well-known stock like Amazon or Zoom at the start of a pandemic, it doesn't feel like you have to be in a special place to do that, right? Right, publicly traded. These are publicly traded companies that have been yeah. on the market for, in the case of Amazon, like it's over a decade, right? So. Yeah, but I think I should alloy that with um, sort of a failure story. Like four or five years back when I was first getting, like shifting away from like Silicon Valley tech consulting and doing more like sustainability consulting around environmental stuff, it was sort of a mix of like social values, investing and wanting to kind of actually bet on the trend. I bought a bunch of like lithium stocks so huh. lithium mining companies in Chile and other places and a um, couple of other, all uniformly screwed me over. Like basically they did very badly and they were underwater for years. And finally, when the whole stock market went up like 2X or something, these barely made it back above the, um, you know, purchase price for me. So I treat that as a loss, even though I didn't lose money. Like in real terms, if it, no, I just left it money. in the index. Yeah, yeah, it would have done better. But yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's just balancing it out. It's really funny that you mentioned like I cut the lithium stock thing feels like the basic investment. There's like some level I don't kill basic, but it's like betting on rawness, like a raw bet. I've I've made some raw bets in the past that haven't worked out. Um, and it always seems to be in a similar. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Stock picking, I, I, I guess, is like uh, people say you can't beat the professionals, but when things change very suddenly, there's a small window of opportunity when retail investors can do like brain dead obvious things and come out ahead. But if you think you can do that all the time, you're like deluding yourself. So it's like, it's not set up for all the like ordinary retail investors to win all the time. It's like once right. every five years right right um, and like the thing i was thinking you know i've been thinking about this a lot i just finished reading i think it's bogle's common sense investing um book on so bogle was the man who invented the mutual fund as we know it the, well, the total index fund uh he's like started vanguard um and he's written a bunch of little books about like investing in stock like in um mutual funds i just read his book like a few weeks ago and my only conclusions about it is that the reason that getting into an index fund is a better deal than picking stocks is because you pick the winner and it goes up, but then it like at some point it like flattens out. You know, it's got that curve of development where like mm -hmm. there's like the adoption or like the, you know, it kind of goes through and then it hits a maturity phase and then it matures out a little bit. The thing about buying into it, an index fund is that you don't have to you naturally are falling into all the new things that are have yet to hit their like exponential growth curve or whatever. Whereas if you pick a stock and it does really well, you're probably not going to sell it because it did well, just because of the way that like your psychology works, you're not going to take that capital and redeploy it into something that still hasn't hit that growth curve yet. Whereas if you're in a total index fund, then it's doing the rebalancing for you like every month or every quarter. Um, so the real benefit of being in a total index fund and just holding is that you get all those like pops, right? So you, yeah. you buy into all the pops and uh, you don't have to like transfer over to the next and the next thing comes along. The, the, there I think is where one of the more recent criticisms of like passive investing uh, uh, makes sense because 
so much of like the high growth phase of uh, newer stocks happens when it's still in private hands that you basically get very little. Like I was fortunate enough because I was consulting for Tesla for a while, I sort of paid attention and I bought in in early, like well before uh, Tesla entered the S&P. But remember when Tesla entered the S&P, it was already so huge, it entered at number six or something. So one of the reasons the stock exploded was simply that all these sort of automated index funds had to buy huge amounts of it just to like make up their pie chart properly, right? So a lot of the growth in Tesla after it entered the S&P was purely structural. And I benefited from that because I happened to get in early for like random reasons. And I think I started like, a, I was a pure believer in the whole Burton Mulkill random walk on Wall Street passive investing philosophy. I was a big believer in that until I think about 2014, 15. Then I kept hearing more and more buzz in Silicon Valley, especially about how more and more growth was happening in early stage pre-IPO and IPOs were getting delayed as well as private equity, like, you know, things going private. And I was mm-hmm. like, all right, I'm now not an accredited investor, so I can't participate in like startup growth, but maybe I can do that by at least sort of piggybacking where I feel like I know something slightly. So Tesla is an example of that. Um, so yeah, it, it's like opportunities for individual victory, I think are getting squeezed out of the retail market. Uh, victory in the stock well that, maybe that's what made the game stock thing so exciting right is that like a whole community of people and i think it fits the the pattern that we established earlier in this episode about victory being something you like plan and work for and then accomplish yep. um the game stop thing was definitely like someone like kind of hatched a plan right like hey like i've observed this about this game stock it's trying someone's trying to short squeeze it yeah we can yep. bat it by popping the price up and then doing the i think they call it like a gamma squeeze, which I, I'm not going to pretend to even know what that means. It, it, I think it has to do with like margin requirements and yeah, yeah. Um, pushing, like taking the fact that so many people have positions that have to buy it at some point if it goes above a certain yeah, price, yeah. you push it above that price and you get more people, more yeah. influx of capital into the stock and then you can sell out a profit. Yeah, that's actually interesting. I think... Uh... Uh, somebody did an analysis and Wall Street Bets, uh, the group that did this GameStop thing, uh, I believe it performs better than several hedge funds or something. So in terms of like actual ability to detect alpha and act on it, that Reddit group um, wins better than many hedge funds, at least in some narrow comparisons. But but I think we're um, talking too much about victory in the context of investing. Let's broaden it a little bit. So, um, okay, what's a good way? Like, uh, assuming you- uh, okay, I have a game to suggest before that. Like, uh, how about we each share three prizes we've won through our life? And um, okay. if there's interesting stories there. So, a prize each. Let's go. What's okay, your first uh, prize? I think, yeah, uh, I prize. So, my family, we used to always go to the same, like, one of my cousins would have this big Thanksgiving meal, and every Thanksgiving they'd have a raffle or, like, the, you know, put your names in a hat and draw out the hand names and, like, a couple bunch of people get little presents and I think what like one of the first things I remember winning is I won this like it was a little turkey made out of wood that um had little spots that you could put lollipops in it so it would have like <laughs> a feathers on the background and that was like winning that was just the biggest surprise of my life because I don't think I even knew like what was going on and then someone was like here Lisa you get this like present I was like what wow this is great um you know like six or seven but this was a lottery right no skill involved by so it kind of doesn't qualify by our definition it was you won that's um, true. yeah but it, it did feel like a, an, a i don't know it was very exciting <laughs> all right what's my first one mine would count as a true victory though if i tell the story of it it'll look like a joke i actually have two gold medals in swimming from college level swimming championships but <laughs> do not read much into that. I am not a good swimmer. So there's a story to be told there. Basically, yeah, since I went to a nerdy uh, engineering college, which not much of a sports culture, there wasn't much competition to get into teams of any sort. So anybody who could like swim reasonably well without drowning would get into the team. And I ended up on the water polo team and um, they were, I wasn't good enough to race in any of the individual events. So the coach wouldn't put me on like, you know, the actual racing events, but okay. I was on the water polo team, but I wasn't actually allowed to get into the pool. Uh, but I was like the water boy basically. And I went with 
a team on tour twice. The first year I didn't get to play in a single game. Like I didn't even get in the water, but I came away with the gold medal because my team won. So the team gold medal. And the next okay. year, the coach put me in for one quarter of one game and I played so badly, I let in a goal. <laughs> so my one achievement in competitive water polo is letting in a goal. But my team again happened to win that year as well. So I got a second gold medal. So for the rest of, so this was in junior year and for the rest of my time in um, undergrad, everybody would make fun of me like, oh, you're the double gold medalist. This is funny because there were like much, much better athletes and sportsmen in my uh, hostel. So that's like a dorm, way better athletes than me. But most of them like might have like one gold and one silver from like intercollegiate <laughs> athletics. I was, I think, alongside the best athlete in the uh, hostel, I was one of the few people who had two gold medals to my name, but it became a joke because so I so clearly did not deserve either of them that it became like a running joke. But that's my first victory story. Two gold medals I did not deserve at all. Two undeserved gold medals, wow. That was hot. What's that was your next? That was a tough one to beat, Venkat. Um, I don't have anything that like self effacing um, I don't know. I like. I guess like I got. I was like named. I I read the most like. I don't know. In third grade, we had a AARP, which is like advanced reading thing. It's basically like multiple choice tests. You read a book and you take a multiple choice test on a computer. Um, I got the most points out of my like entire class. <laughs> they let me be principal for a day which meant I got to like walk around. I don't even remember what being principal was like. I just remember I like didn't have to go to class all day and like got to walk around and eat snack, like candy and stuff. It was great. Um, it was a lot less exciting when everyone else, like other people started getting, I think it like, I was the first one to hit like a hundred ARP points or whatever. Um, and then other people started hitting it behind me. And I was like, wait, what's going on? Like, I thought I was the one who like won this like thing. Everyone else can't do the thing. I already did it. What's going on here? I don't know. That's not, that's not nearly as good a story as like being an unathletic double-time <laughs> gold medalist, but um, yeah. But it's funny, yeah. Uh, let me, okay, so for my second one, let's see if I can think of another equally funny undeserved victory. Uh, I think deserved victories aren't stories, right? Because there's nothing to tell. It was like, I was good at something, I tried hard and I won something and got a prize. It's like, there's no story there. So it's only a fun story if you totally didn't deserve it. So. Uh, this one is like, I partly deserved it, I think, and it's um, more recent, 2009, I think. So this company called Plantronics, which makes uh, headphones and like audio equipment kind of stuff, so mid-level stuff. Uh, they ran a contest for, propose a term for remote workers. So remember, this is 2009 when remote working was first becoming a thing. So I wrote a blog post, um, and my term was cloud worker, so working from the cloud. So I wrote that blog post and I sort of promoted it a bit, but then I was working at Xerox at the time, my team sort of got enthusiastic about it and uh, um, made up a voting ring. So everybody was voting for me. And one of the guys on my team, a smart programmer, he kind of wrote a little script to fire up a bunch of browser windows and like vote a lot for me. So basically I gamed an online, <laughs> I didn't totally game it. Like I was actually getting uh, votes partly because I was a blogger and could promote my stuff and so forth. But it was partly undeserved because I had like people pulling for me, even doing like the script thing. But yeah, I won. So <laughs> the Plantronics declared cloud worker to be the new term for remote worker. And they sent me like a couple of hundred dollars worth of like a random audio gear, like Bluetooth headphones and stuff. I gave most of it away. So that's my sort of redemption for like mm. undeserved victory. I gave most of the actual equipment away, but that's my second story. All right. That's a you good know a third story. story? My third story. My third story. I don't know if I've told it before. Um, when I worked, so I worked at Walmart one summer as an intern in their IT department. Um, there were a bunch of like, so every department had like a set of interns, the IT department interns. It took, us, it took me a while to figure this out. I think other people in my cohort figured it out before I did. But like the marketing interns were treated a lot nicer than the IT department interns were. Like they got the corporate departments that were closer to the office, say like a five minute drive instead of a 20 minute drive. Um, they got to work in like the big fancy like buildings. They got nicer stuff. Whereas we were out with like the IT people and like the old converted warehouse um but like you know so it's like kind of this like divide between like IT interns and not IT interns and I'm like a little clueless so 
I like didn't, it took me a long time to realize this was even a thing that was going on at all. Like I was very happy. I was having a great time. Um, anyways, end of the year rolls around and they announced that they were going to do like a vote for, you know, just kind of like end of intern, like, oh, here's some categories, vote for your fellow interns. And then we're gonna have a big award ceremony and we're gonna hand out prizes to people. Um, so I don't know how I figured this out, but I decided that I was going to organize and run a primary for all the positions for within the IT department. So the idea is that like the IT interns, because we were more of us than anyone else, mm -hmm. we were going to like decide who was going to represent the IT department and send in our and vote for our vote for that person. So I like over email organize a whole um, and I had like a spreadsheet and like, you know, people would talk about whatever and I just had everyone send me the votes. And so, yes, they were just trusting me to tabulate it all. I tabulated it all and said, I like here, hey guys, here's like the tabulations I got from all the votes and everyone like vote for whoever you want. But this is like the, this is like the ballot for like the sponsored ballot from the IT department. And so I think most people probably copy pasted what I sent out and emailed it in. So, you know, we don't get any feedback though. Like you send in your th responses. There were a couple of races that like, a lot of you know it's like people clearly like it was kind of like tied so i think in those cases most people just put whoever they wanted when they sent sent it in instead of like who mm -hmm. i said whatever anyways the day rolls around and the lady gets up to hand out the awards and she says oh so you know usually we just get one reward but this year we decided to give one two awards out for every category because we had such an overwhelming whatever and i realized in that moment that like we had won but they had changed the rules like the IT department had swept it, but they changed the rules so that just the IT kids didn't get all the rewards. They like, <laughs> they came out and they did like two for each, the top two got it. So in every single category, there was an IT, a kid from the IT department, like intern, plus like a, a, someone from like the rest of the like intern class who got awards, except in the case where there had been a tie and the IT vote had gotten split. And in that case, both the IT person, people got the award for that like category. Um, it was like, yeah, it was hilarious. I mean, it was like, it was probably the most fun I've ever had. It's probably like the first time, like, I don't know how often, like organizing at Walmart is not something like, you know, behind the scenes organizing isn't something that people at Walmart are known for. Um, like, <laughs> that's funny. I think that's actually the biggest kind of meta victory you could hope to have where you win so much that they're forced to change the rules to stop you from winning everything, right? <laughs> That's, that's but it was such funny. a good, that, I mean, honestly, Venkat, it was like kind of a good lesson to learn like really early in your career that like, this don't win so much. What? <laughs> don't win too much, otherwise you'll change the rules. Yeah, well, that's like, yeah, that like the rules are changeable, yo. Like if they don't like the response, someone will like change it so that they like what comes out. And I like, you know, I don't know. It's definitely a weird feeling sitting at that like thing with my like manager and being like, what the fuck have I done? Oh shit. Like. <laughs> Ah, that, that's a good story. Ah, I don't know if I can top that. Uh, do I have a story where my winning forced them to change the rules? That's actually a very difficult one. Uh, well, not change the rules so much, but um, okay. So this one is in my uh, grad school uh, astrodynamics class. So this was the, this is the course where they teach you about orbits and like, you know, how to calculate spacecraft orbits and stuff. And the final term paper sort of um, our final examination was a programming challenge for uh, what's known as continuous thrust spacecraft. So this is uh, normal rockets, like boom, the rocket goes up and lets the spacecraft go and the spacecraft like is on its orbit and then sort of uh, thrusts around, right? This home, like exam problem was what's known as continuous thrust, where it's like a small weak rocket that's thrusting continuously from low orbit. So it kind of spirals out. It doesn't do these like jump transfers between orbits. So the exam challenge was to do the, uh, basically raise the orbit as much as you can given the fuel budget, something like that. Mm -hmm. And we learned a bunch of techniques there. Uh, but I think I was the one who came up with like the most uh, inelegant brute force way of like trying to solve the problem, which was 
at every point in the orbit, I would simply like compute like, so basically the thing you were controlling was the thruster angle. So there was this continuous ionic thruster and there would be an angle showing which way it pointed. So really it was an optimization problem for one angle. So I basically brute forced it every time step in the simulation, I would just compute and say, all right, what direction should I point it at? I'm pointing it at that. And it turned out that um, even though that was a brute force method, that turned out to be right because uh, what turned out to be the optimal solution is what's called a bang bang controller. But it's like for long periods, the angle is at one extreme, then it switches rapidly to the other side and points at the other extreme. And this is a kind of discontinuous controller that you can't really easily figure out by doing like clever math. It's like the kind of solution that's likely to pop out of simulation. So I did that and I got a really good, like there's a figure of merit and like, you know, the higher the number, the better your answer. And mine was a 20.3 or something like that. So I knew I'd done reasonably well, but I was curious to know if I'd beat everybody else in class. So after the exam and we got our grade, I emailed the professor saying, hey, did I actually get the best number? And he was like, yeah, the next highest was like 9.3 or something like that. So I like more than twice beat that guy. So I had a good conversation with him about him uh, about it with my professor about like, sometimes you don't want to do the clever pen and paper math to figure stuff out. Sometimes you just want to brute force it. So uh, in a way I would say that's a change the rules of the game kind of uh, uh, victory because Normally, when you learn classical astrodynamics like Newton's methods and stuff, you try to like solve the equations and do these like beautiful smooth things. There's like classical orbit design approaches that you use, but this was like a new kind of propulsion and it felt like I should just like brute force it. So that was fun. That was my slightly technical third victory story. <laughs> yeah. That's a great story, yeah. So your rocket got to the destination most more efficiently than everyone else's? Like... Or it got farthest given its fuel load. Yeah. I see. Okay. Yeah. I, I want to tell one more story along those lines, which is not mine, but an actual real life mission. Uh, so this is a mission called the H2. It was Japan's first moon mission. And when it launched the spacecraft, uh, the spacecraft ended up in a slightly wrong orbit and didn't have enough fuel to get to the moon. Uh, but a guy at JPL named Ed Bell Bruno, he did this weird thing where instead of solving the earth moon spacecraft as a you know, two body problem. The spacecraft is a tiny object you can kind of ignore. He added the sun's gravity into it and he was able to come up with sort of a chaotic solution that even with um, the low amount of fuel managed to get to the moon. And that became legendary in like space flight planning circles. It's known as, uh, I forget what it's called, chaotic perturbation orbit solutions or something. So he wrote a whole textbook about it. So it's like, again, changed the game of orbit design. That's awesome, that's really fun. And he did that just by like adding another body. Yes, so instead of using the normal earth moon spacecraft uh, system approximation, he used the earth moon sun spacecraft four body problem. And basically that's how you do astrodynamics. Like the more factors you take in, the more unsolvable the equations become and the more careful the computation has to be. So I see. yeah, so he basically exploited chaos dynamics. Yeah, I see, that's cool, okay, interesting. All right, so those are our three victory stories, yeah. Those are some pretty good victories, yeah. Um, have we talked about the Mars helicopter yet, speaking of victories? I mean, that seems like a pretty big victory. Yeah, that's actually a, another big victory for changing the rules of the game, because this I just learned recently. Unlike most space electronics, this is not radiation hardened special chips. This is like off the shelf uh, crap like you and I might buy, like ordered off the SparkFun catalog, so literally consumer grade off the shelf electronics. That's what they shoved into the uh, helicopter. So by the way, this uh, leads to something interesting. I might have said this before on a different thing. It feels like I've said this recently, but uh, yeah, the main Perseverance rover, it uses a 1998 power PC. Like I think that was used in the Mac uh, G3 or something in 1998. So really ancient processor on like, I think 256 nanometer technology or something. So ancient. The main Perseverance rover uses that because it's a radiation hardened uh, special chip. But the uh, Ingenuity helicopter actually uses like a 2014 chip or something. So the, basically the point is the little toy helicopter that's flying around has vastly more processing power than the main rover that's controlling it because it's using off the shelf uh, more recent chips. Okay. So that's kind of interesting. So it's a victory. So since that's worked now, more people are thinking of using non-radiation hardened uh, chips and other space missions. So that's fun. 
Well, okay, so they didn't use the radiation hard hardened chips. What does that mean? Like, does it mean that it's gonna? It's like more. It's less reliable. So basically, uh, what they do for radiation hardening is they take a regular architecture, and they. Uh, do the uh, lithography on uh, different substrates. So instead of like silicon, silicon dioxide, it's uh, quartz, I believe. Quartz, something else. I forget what. Is it quartz? Uh, I'll look it up. But there's a, they use special substrates, which mean the lithography is uh, more constrained. And they sometimes have to redesign the circuits because the wires are laid out differently. So that's one part of it. The other part is like, you know, more redundancy. So you might have multiple cores for the same function. You might have voting. Like, you know, if you have a navigation computer, you make three navigation computers and then best two out of three wins because like random cosmic rays might like, you know, screw up a register and therefore it's showing the wrong value. So that's basically what radiation hardening is. Some physical changes in the actual hardware and then some architectural changes in how you sort of deploy it. Yeah, so that kind of hardening is really important for anything that's in space, right? Because it doesn't have the magnetic field to protect it from cosmic radiation, is my understanding. Yep. Um, but on the planet of Mars, does Mars have a magnetic field? It does not. That's actually one of the big problems of operating on Mars. It uh, may have had a magnetic field once in the past. It doesn't, I guess because it doesn't have a molten core anymore. But that's one of the reasons terraforming Mars is going to be really hard because on Earth, the ionosphere protects us from radiation. And on Mars, it's almost as bad as hard vacuum. Not as bad, there's a little bit protection. So there's lots of proposals to create a magnetosphere around uh, Mars in artificial ways, but nobody knows. Like That's why one of the things that people do is propose underground things, not just so you can trap an atmosphere there, but to protect you from radiation. Interesting, yeah. I didn't know that, sorry. <laughs> you're bored by out. that, you're yawning. Well, I know. So All right. Bad. So those are our victory stories. Well, yeah, I don't know. So are there, this is kind of like a tangent, but out of curiosity, are there any other planets that have magnet spheres like ours? Magnet I spheres. think Venus does. Venus, Venus is larger than Mars. Venus has other problems, of course. Um, and all the big gas giants do, like Jupiter, Saturn, they have such hugely mm -hmm. powerful uh, magnetic fields that the magnetic fields themselves become a problem. And because they're like hot gaseous bodies, they create their own radiation. So actually Saturn and uh, Jupiter are harder environments to do space missions in because the radiative environment is actually worse than like far away from those planets. Oh, huh, interesting, okay. Like after the sun, they're the biggest sources of like harsh radiation. Oh, I didn't know that. Fascinating. So if you actually sent something there, you would need everything to be super hardened to get yeah. used to it. So the Mar uh, so Jupiter and Saturn missions tend to be like super hardened properly. Cool. All right. We are at 307. So about the closing point, any other thoughts on victories? Any victory you're looking forward to right now? No. I would say, I mean, I already got vaccinated. I like, no, no. Oh, you, you got both your shots? Yeah, I'm done. Oh, okay. I'm waiting for that particular vaccine victory. And my second shot is on May 8th, I think. So then two, May 7th. So two weeks after that, I will be home clear, hopefully. So when's the next meetup? Venkat, we have in a, a refactor camp, you said got retired. Are you doing like, when's your next IRL thing? I don't know. I'm kind of tired of IRL events overall. I'm enjoying like the Zoom life. Uh, somebody else might do events I might go to, but I'm kind of not into organizing events anymore. I see. Are you planning to start a chain fail crypto meetup in uh, Houston? No, but there's a, there's a Bitcoin meetup here. Someone else is running a Bitcoin meetup. It's great. So I just have to show up. The showing up thing. Um, yeah, yeah. And now you can, you're vaccinated. So uh, are you actually going out and about? No. No, not yet? No. I mean, my life doesn't, my life has not changed. <laughs> That'll take a while, I think. Yeah. Anyway. All right, cool. so All next right. week so next is week U, is right? W. Oh, sorry, no, U, V, W, sorry. Next week is W. Two Vs, um, we'll figure something out. All right, so we'll have to figure out something for W. Great. All right. I'll talk to you All next right. week. All right. See you next week. Bye. Scorpio season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, 
and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokinscrews.com. Great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.